G'day everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Christie-David, and I run a mortgage broking business called Atelier Wealth, where we help property investors start out and scale up their property portfolios. And for the ambitious uh, property investor, a big part of their journey is choosing the right property manager, uh, making sure that their greatest asset and their investment is in good hands and managed by someone who's competent and confident. And I'm thrilled to be introducing on today's show, Jade Costello from Melbourne Rental Search. G'day, Jade. How are you doing? I'm good, Aaron. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Coming all the way from us. Um, I mean, you've got your beautiful scarf on there from chilly Melbourne, I'm sure. Oh, my gosh. And it is so chilly. I'm looking out the window and it's dreary. It's grey. It's classic Melbourne winter. <laughs> Probably got a fireplace going or something nice down there in Melbourne to keep yourselves warm. Uh, <laughs> before we do kick off, I want to be uh, very clear that uh, the conversation that Jade and I have is very general in nature and not intended to give advice. So if it's advice you're after, please find uh, a suitable expert and make sure you pay for that advice as well. So Jade, uh, I know that you've got uh, a wonderful tenure in the real estate uh, industry and, uh, and your background has started, you know, you start out in prestige property, moving away through to property management. And now I guess with your business, I guess with your business, rent, uh, Melbourne Rental Search, you've now really carved out a niche for yourselves, which is helping people relocate and enter back into the Melbourne property market, the rental market and drawing all that, all that experience to help them avoid pitfalls, matching them out with the right area, the right type of property. It's a real, uh, it's a real niche service, but I guess when you, when you micro niche, you then find people that absolutely need your service, isn't it? Oh, yeah, we, they do. They really do. And when we sort of had this idea, myself and my business partner, we we knew there was a need. I worked in property management and leasing for a while, and we often got calls from people moving from interstate or abroad that would see a property that they like online, um, yeah. but they would sort of say, oh, how do I go about applying for it? And at that time, you couldn't uh, lease a property without either you inspecting it or someone inspecting it inspecting it on their behalf. Uh, yeah. So unless you had a family member or a friend that was here on the ground, you had to fly here, get an Airbnb or hotel for a certain amount of time, go to inspections, which were sometimes cancelled at the last minute, um, get back there, have, have spent all this money, don't have a property still. It was all just a bit of a headache. And so I remember thinking, gosh, it'd be great if there was someone who, similar to a relocation agent, helped yeah. source a property um, for you and helped you kind of move, but not concentrate on things like a school search and um, community and things. It's basically just the property search, which really I think encompasses like the success of someone's move to a new city. Once you find your, your home where you're going to be, you can kind of get all the other little bits and pieces of the puzzle to fit into place. So when we first started, we thought, let's see if there, there's a need for it. And then pretty early on, um, some journalists reached out and said, oh, this is pretty interesting. It's kind of a bit like a buyer's advocate, but just mm. for, for rentals. Um, and then it just went gangbusters. It just went completely ballistic. And so many people reached out and said, oh, if only we had known that something like this existed when we moved. And so pretty early on, we realized we we're onto a good thing. Yes. And yeah, here we are. Excellent. Uh, so leading on to that, it's what I to introduce yourself. It's what I call the three P's about yourself. Personally, we're touching your professional journey. We can elaborate on that as well, and bit and property journey as well. If you may share and indulge us. Okay, the three P's. So first, uh, personally, yeah. Um, so I'm a mum. I've got a two year old and a four year old. You have to get your hands full, don't you? Full. That's it. But um, it's fun. It's always very fun. And after a big day, that's kind of that's the best. I feel like when you're, when you're a working mum, the time that you do have with your kids is just all the more sort of precious and yeah. I'm very keen on trying to be the fun mum in that time. So we're out doing things. It's great. My husband works a lot abroad. Um, he didn't during COVID. He completely stopped. But now he's out and travelling again. So um, I'm back to kind of like juggling kids and, mm. and work and it's, it's all just, it's a lot of fun. So that's me personally. Yeah. Um, professionally, um, I've worked in leasing, in, in residential um, leasing, um, property management. I worked for a buyer's advocate for some time. Um, I've now gone into, I guess you could call it more of a, like a tenant advocacy role. Yeah. Um, my, my family are all into real estate. So my grandfather he owned a real estate agency. He was a real estate agent 
or my uncles, my brother are all real estate agents, my right. mum is a property developer, my husband works in commercial. So it's a lifestyle. It's in the genes. It is. It's in the blood. It's in the genes. Property. Um, <laughs> many good conversations about property. And um, and that's very much what I want to ask. We'll kind of kick off with, with the property and the state of the market. And we talk about vacancy rates and, you know, some is calling it like a rental crisis. So you've been very much at the forefront of this, seeing what's happening on the ground and seeing the demand probably exceed some of the supply for good quality properties for, for tenants. Mm-hmm. So tell me through, what are you seeing, especially in Melbourne on the ground at the moment? So it's really interesting because during COVID, everything just slowed right, right down. And there wasn't much happening at all. We were sort of telling clients, the few clients that we had coming on during COVID, um, the ones that were brave enough to to come to Melbourne, um, that this is a tenant's market, be a bit cheeky, offer a little less than than the going rate. Like we were just, it was, we had never seen anything like, like that before. And then fast forward 12 months, the shift has been unbelievable. So not only, of course, have rents gone back to to where they should be sitting, but we're finding tenants are so desperate to get into a property, they're often offering more than Mm. um, than the advertised rental amount. And just the sheer number of people going for the same property is through the roof. So we used to see it was pretty normal that you would go to a good quality property that was priced right and um, and presented well. You might have one or two other applications. And we tend to like to think that our our clients were mostly, usually the approved applicant. They were coming through us. We were helping them with their application. They were putting their, their best foot forward. It's just not like that anymore. I mean, we are going to properties and often having our clients as top-end executives that are applying for properties that are well over $1,000 per week and there'll be another 10 applications that we're going up against. Wow. And it's just not that shoeing that we that we had before. The, the demand is just so, so strong. And the demand is driven by, uh, is it people coming back to Melbourne? Is it people that are, are moving back, say, closer to the city after being away? What, what are you seeing? Mm, yeah, it's, it's actually a little bit of a, of a mix. So we had an influx of people, particularly in Melbourne, that moved out of Melbourne during that yeah. time, to Queensland and went to regional areas. Um, I think there's a portion of those that certainly have stayed away. But now that offices are kind of requesting that um, – that staff come back into the office. We are seeing a chunk of those people moving back. So I think there's an element of that. Uh, I think in terms of um, building, building has been down with construction costs going up, um, interest going up. We're not seeing perhaps the um, the developments that we were once sort of seeing before. I think just the demand is is so much higher than the stock that's, mm-hmm. that's out there. Um, of course, international students uh, are also coming back as well. So um, it's kind of the perfect storm. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly what you're saying. And so the next question I had there is, is it is it to a particular type of property and people are more looking for houses or units? But when you talk about students coming back, typically that's the apartment market and starts to kind of fire up a little bit more. And if you're talking about people that are relocated back to Melbourne, families, and it's typically the houses as well, isn't it? You see that competition. Yeah. So in terms of um, in terms of sort of just during that COVID break and and even just coming out of that, the demand for houses with land was strong, or even units, or if we were going for apartments, something with a balcony, anything that didn't have any outdoor space was just there was just no need for it. Mm. So they couldn't give them away. Um, there has been a bit of a shift. So now the kind of life's getting back to normal. We are starting to see um, a lot more demand for those inner city apartments again. Um, There is, I I think now that we're not faced with the lockdowns, people have got the trust back that the lockdowns are not going to become um, sort of so common that now we're seeing the demand for the apartments um, back up and running like massively. I went to a inspection um, this weekend just gone and there would have been 30 people at this little two-bedroom apartment. There was nothing special about it. It was just, um, it was probably priced correctly. It yeah. was in an okay location. It wasn't presented pr- particularly well. Um, it, it, it just, again, a sign of a sign of the times. But I, I think the trust there for apartments is back. So, I think it's leveling out for, for, for a time there. If we had had this conversation six months ago, I would have said definitely houses are the preferred, but um, there's, there's leveling out. It just depends on the individual now. 
Yeah, very nice. And we're talking about migration back. So you're talking about in, you know, international students. You're saying that borders open out for now, you know, work, work to find it out. What else are you seeing? Because a good part of your clients, um, people moving into Melbourne, right? Mm-hmm. So what's the mix for you at the moment, people that are renting locally or people that are moving back in, uh, from international or interstate? What are you seeing on the ground, Jade? Um, so in terms of, so our clients are really a bit of a 50-50 mix at the moment. We had a real um, kind of built-up demand that people who were planning to move over the last two years but just couldn't. Yeah. Um, so we're seeing that um, these people now, and this actually could be another reason for, for why there's just such an influx of people now, is all of those people over the last two years that were, were planning to move are all kind of coming out in droves at the moment. And I, I guess same with um, interstate I'd say it really is just a bit of a 50-50 mix. Our our business is not so much seeing people who are moving back to Melbourne. We've had very few of those clients. It really is people who are moving here for the first time. And majority of our clients don't tend to come out first to um, do a bit of a reconnaissance trips and have a look around and whatever. They're really going from what they're seeing online and doing a lot of their own independent research about Melbourne or whatever city they're going to, a lot of forums, a lot of Facebook. Um, yes. uh, so so that's been interesting to see as well. People are just turning online a lot more and just the way that we're working and doing things and the way that people are moving around is just so much different now. Yeah, I, I agree. Seeing that, I'm seeing that across it's city markets, very similar. Um, the demand, uh, all the agents that I speak to, all the property managers I speak to inside Sydney is in the exact same trend, which is, you know, those units that may have been for international students or CBD workers, now they're back in demand and the price intensity and people offering six months in advance or paying above just to try and get that property off the market so they can move in. Um, yeah, I just feel like that's with no new apartments or that that lack of supply coming on is really putting that pressure on uh, on on rents. Now, that's a, it's tough if you're renting but it's a win if you're an investor with this property as part of oh your my portfolio. Goodness, of course. Isn't it? Yeah, so. absolutely. This is an amazing time to be an investor. Absolutely. So when when we're talking, and you mentioned this before about hey, when we did uh, tenant you know, applications, we had a pretty good uh, strike rate because you know exactly what you're doing, you know what the property managers want to see. They're well put together applications. So kind of switching gears a little bit for someone that's looking to not rent necessarily, but people that are reviewing tenants' applications, what is your trained eye looking for that separates your great application compared to maybe a mediocre tenant application, which might not get a look in? Mm -hmm. Okay. So as an investor or as a property manager, you're really looking for two things. Can this person pay the rent and are they going to pay the rent? Uh, And um, are they going to care for the property? So, Property, and it's been really insightful being on this other side um, and kind of applying more so than like checking applications and doing that that side. Um, what, what I do know is property managers have sort of a checklist of what they want. Um, does this person have um, a steady job? Can they provide the, their three last pay slips? Uh, do they have a rental reference, someone that I can, um, an agent perhaps that I can contact that can say, yes, this person's paid their rent, they were good to deal with, they were bad, they had a dog, they didn't have a dog, whatever the case may be, and then I've got my checklist and I can kind of tick the boxes. So if you have someone that applies that very much ticks those boxes, it's kind of a... Um, like a bit of a no-brainer. Uh, I guess what I find frustrating being on this other side, and sometimes I feel like a lot of property managers who are perhaps young in the industry or just simply don't have enough hours in the day, if a tenant falls sort of in their lap and puts an application forth that's outside of that norm, which does happen a lot, they kind mm. of put it in the too hard basket and perhaps don't educate investors enough um, to, to consider some of these tenants who, who are often really great. So that may be, um, let's just take the first example, uh, someone who uh, doesn't have a rental reference because they own their own home. Mm. So the way that you would get around that is you would ask for um, proof of ownership, that, that yeah. like a council rates notice or something like that. Um, um, and even speaking to the person who's either selling their home or the agent who's got the listing for their home to see how they've been sort of de- dealing with, there's always ways around that. I always say jump online and have a look at the home that they're selling or that they've put up to lease, see how it's been presented um, to get around around that. 
someone who perhaps doesn't have a role that they've been in for a long time. My clients, a lot of the time, are moving to the Melbourne for the first time from abroad. So they're moving often for a job opportunity. So in that case, you would simply ask them to provide a, um, a letter of employment or a letter of offer for yeah. that new role. Um, getting references from overseas would be really great if property managers spend that little bit of extra time and just wait for that return email opposed to just too hard basket because these people who are coming from overseas tend to be moving the professional people as expats. They they make great tenants. They, they're looking to create a, a new home, a new life. They're usually, sorry, excuse me, usually long-term tenants. So yeah. doing those extra couple of checks, whilst it's not ideal on paper um, when compared to someone that it's just easily done, you can just tick those boxes, it's worth having a property manager that's willing to kind of go the extra mile just to, to check those things off for sure. Well said. And I think we just pick a property manager by default and I can kind of experience share if I can. I mean, we had one issue on our properties. The tenant you know, wasn't paying rent. There was an issue with uh, you know, child support payment to his ex and it became a bit of a bit of a calamity when, when it shouldn't have and, uh, and they ended up you know, almost going to a tribunal or something along those lines, right? So um, I'm not saying that they were inexperienced, but there's ways that you could have kind of nipped this in the butt a little bit earlier potentially as well and had those conversations rather than kind of letting it drag out but now there's, you know, weeks in arrears, for example, as well. So you've mentioned before about the state of the property manager, property management industry, and I feel like it's got some similarities to mortgage broking, which is very low barriers to entry, for example, be like real estate, do a license, you're accredited within a few days and off you go on your merry way and mm-hmm. start seeing clients, right? And, sure. uh, and there's, you're practicing on real life clients, as opposed to learning your trade, being part of a team, you know, picking up the little nuances, for example. So, I mean, having been through that journey as well, when someone's picking a property manager, what is your advice for someone? Yes. Okay. So on that, and I've kind of briefly touched on this before, yeah. I've been horrified being <laughs> on this other side to see um, the level of service or the lack of the level of service sort of on this side and maybe not so much on the property side of it. So that's because once I um, secure a property for my clients, that's where I really step back. So it's really more on that initial leasing that I'm sort of seeing that the lack of service being um, less than ideal. I think when choosing a property manager, I would really love investors to secret shop them. So in those early days, it'd be wonderful if you see a property that they're looking after online um, and put through an inquiry just by email would be my first port of call and see uh, what the replies you get back. Um, Does this property have heating or cooling or a certain question about it. Um, A lot of the times these inquiries just don't get answered. Um, Picking up the phone and seeing if it's possible to get an inspection outside of the set open for inspection that's there, you could sort of present yourself as someone that is... um, that can't make it due to work is, is have they got a dedicated leasing consultant that could pop out and show a prospective tenant through. Um, a lot of the times we're finding if you can't make that set inspection time, you miss out. And I think if in my situation, a lot of the time when I am trying to find a property for a tenant and just calls are going unanswered or emails are going unanswered. And I've got tenants that are often offering up to $100 a week or more to secure a property that they love um, and, and you just can't get through. I thought, can you imagine if the owner of this property knew how like horrified they would be? So really doing that secret shop at the start and putting your foot in that in, in a tenant's perspective and, and inquiring about other properties that they have on their, on their rent roll or up for lease is key. Um, what else can I say? I think also the amount of um, the portfolio that each property manager has at that certain agency is a real telltale sign of how many hours they can dedicate to your property. Uh, I think property management, I've always said, is not about property. It's very much about people. Um, it is not a hard job. You just have to be sort of on the ball and, and easy to sort of pick up the phone and, and squash any issues before they come or be on the on keeping your eye on your arrears so it doesn't get out of control. Um, if you have a property manager that has hundreds or even just a hun- over 100 properties to, to manage, they are just spread so thin. 
And I just worry that if there is an issue other than collecting rent or doing anything outside of the norm, how well can they, how many hours in the day do they have to dedicate to it? Yeah. So um, that would be a big one. At any given point, something is probably going wrong, right? It could be the the weather, it could be a tenant issue, it could be repairs, maintenance, it could just be general turnover. So, yeah, the the and I've seen it as well, the expectation and how much how much is on their workload, for example, they don't really ever get a chance to be proactive. It's very much a reactive type role. It's putting out fires. So you can understand why there's that level of turnover sometimes in that industry because you're constantly dealing with putting out fires. It doesn't have that same amount of fun sometimes as what potentially they thought it might be, which is to oh, it's hard space. property management. Yeah, you're just you're dealing with complaints. Oh. You're dealing with owners that sometimes don't want to spend the money for something that's happened. Tenants who are upset that the owner's not going to spend the money, and you're sort of in the, in the middle. I think um, yeah, property management is a hard gig, definitely. Yeah, the look. From a different perspective, uh, one of I guess one of the things we tell our investor clients is when they're looking at properties, well, what what is investment grade, and what that means is what are what are renters looking for from a particular property. So you know, there's things that you can't change, like same the location or sometimes the configuration or layout, for example. But what are some of the property standout features that you, you know when you're speaking to the amount of people that are looking to rent? What features stand out to them that if people are looking to maybe make you make improvements on their property or when they're looking to buy, what are some of these hallmarks that are like high on the list for rented expectations? Do you it think? really depends. So we our clients really range from um, students that just kind of getting their foot in the door to yeah. high end executives who are looking for houses in more prestigious suburbs. So um, it does depend on on where you're at and, and who you're you're looking for a property. For. Four. Um, I do know if we look down more at the more sort of budget properties uh, and we're looking at big apartment blocks, I have been really surprised to think that um, a lot of these uh, developments that have come up with pools and spas and gyms and things like that um, don't tend to be on our tenants list as much. We find that our tenants often have their own gym membership, where it be an F45 or a Pilates class that they're loyal to. So um, these buildings that have all these features that you would think a tenant would go nuts for, maybe not so much. We find our tenants with these kind of budgets of apartments in the city apartments are really looking for a good location in terms of transport, that they can even hop down and get on a tram or a train. Um, And... Second to that, when when looking at apartments, some kind of outlook. So we do find that these apartments, sometimes you're just looking at black wall or another apartment block. If you've got some kind of outlook, Mm. then that can certainly um, be a a preference to to this kind of end, this this sector with a lower lower budget. Um, In more of the higher end, we have a huge demand for people moving to Australia to have a pool. Everyone moves, especially from the UK. They love it, don't they, from the UK? Oh, my gosh, they love it. So we have like a survey that they fill out, like what, what do you love? And they all say, I oh, love a pool because they think people moving to Australia, um, that's kind of the dream or to be walking distance to the, to the beach. But a pool is a big one. And for an investor, you've got to kind of work out, is it worth is it, is it, worth it? Usually tenants are responsible for paying the pool uh, chemicals uh, the the landlord will pay for the the pool maintenance. Can it be factored into the rent? It absolutely can. It's a big selling point for sure. I will say, yeah, it's just one thing that surprised me that all my UK mates say love a pool in a property. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. It's a dream. It's a dream come true. Perfect. Uh, when it comes, again, a lot of investors will then get to the stage that they're looking for rental increases. And sometimes purely just an annual review isn't justification to raise rate, uh, raise the, the rent. So when you're talking to your, and you're having this chat predominantly say tenants, but even the conversation with owners, for example, what's a justification around increases that's within reason, do you think? And being able to have that conversation very openly and as a mature chat rather than just money grab, for example. Yeah, well. definitely. So um, I... Uh, so as an investor, you'd love to see your property just hit kind of certain sort of KPI type things for each year and just keep things steadily growing. Um, 
having said that, and as I kind of touched on before, property management is not so much about property as it is people, there is something to be said about having an exceptional tenant Mm. and rocking the boat when it comes to um, rent increases. So depending, so usually we tend to see a rent increase to be usually quite minimal, um, $10, $20 a week, once a year to kind of keep things going. If you have got a tenant in there that's looking after your property, paying a rent, the rent's always paid on time, you do sometimes have to take into account, all right, if this person was to leave um, and I've got my couple of weeks of vacancy time, my reletting fees and and things, I mean, in today's current market, I don't think tenants are leaving for the sake of $10, $20 a week, but I'm casting my mind to when this is not so much the case. Yeah. I think there's a lot to be said for not always rocking the boat. I, I, I think that perhaps a, a rental increase, um, if justified, like in today's current market, absolutely is justified. Do it. But if you know that your tenant perhaps um, might be a single mom or a student mm-hmm. or something like that, and just doing it maybe every second year, it's almost a bit of a gesture of goodwill. Um, I would want your property manager to sort of say, hey, your, your property is coming up for a lease renewal. You've been a great tenant. Whilst the um, the market's showing that, you're, that, that the owner could get X amount, they um, want to thank you for being such a great tenant. We're, we're going to hold off for a year or so just to build that, that rapport, which I think is so, so important. Um, and then the next year, pop it up. Um, yeah, there's, there's something to be said ab- about about that relationship to, to keep that strong. I'm, I'm so glad you said that because, as, again, the conversation we have with our investor clients is, yes, you may be entitled annually to jack it up or at the end of a lease term, but that turnover, that impact, for example, um, you may get an extra $10 a week, but if it's 500 bucks you're getting and you're trying to get to 510 after a couple of weeks, you're actually in the red. You're, you're yeah. actually financially ahead, especially with the relating fees and then the turnover and a new tenant comes in. Typically, a new tenant will then just find a couple of things that the last tenant was happy to put up with, but they want changed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, just being, just being mindful of going, yeah, just because you can doesn't mean you have to as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Wonderful. Hey, Jade, it's, uh, it's been a real pleasure having a chat and I, I'm, we're keeping a very close eye on the rental market. I feel like, especially down in Melbourne, we, you know, seen almost not an exodus, but, you know, a lot of people kind of making that northerly change up to Queensland. The migration up to Queensland has been something astronom- astronomical, right? Yeah. Uh, but I feel like, yeah, as, as Melbourne kind of has that livability factor and puts itself back on the map in the world as one of those most livable cities, it's going to kind of attract a lot of international um, guests back into into Melbourne as well. But I want to say thank you very much for your insights. Thank you for your knowledge and sharing your time with us as well. Oh, my Uh, pleasure. I appreciate it. Thank you. If you want to reach out to Jade and her team, we will include the details to to their business very shortly below uh, Melbourne Rental Search. You can reach out and get in touch on if you have any questions about renting in Melbourne or if you have an investment property in Melbourne, feel free to reach out to them as well. Jade, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Awesome. No dramas. That's a, wrap, but that's a wrap for another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. Until next time, take care.